We're going to talk about Palm Sunday today, and we're going to talk about the truths of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is also known as the triumphal entry. I love what one of the guys in Alpha, if you're part of Rooted Right, we've been doing the Alpha program, and I thank you for all those that are participating in that. And he said this to the group, and it was, it was a powerful statement. And I do believe the more that I get to know the history and the background of where people stand in their faith and in their walk with Christ, he said, I feel like we need to be retaught or retrained what it means to be a Christian. And the more people I get around, I see people that are hurt from their childhood for various reasons. And a lot of it has to stem from their first perception of what it meant to be a follower of Christ or what their church did and, and some of the do's and the don'ts that they may have been feeling, even if they were just a child and they didn't realize that the people in, in their lives had good intentions. But I hear many things like, oh, I was forced to memorize the scripture, and if I didn't, I was going to fail, and they were going to make me start my class all over again. And somebody else, especially think when you're a child, and somebody on Sunday, you, you're watching them praise the Lord, and then you go home, and you deal with all the stuff that this world throws at you. It must be pretty confusing for a young person, much less it's confusing sometimes for us as adults. When we can't live this thing out and you become feeling like a hypocrite. And so I'm seeing that there's tons of people that are hurt. And so maybe we need to be retaught. I was thinking about Palm Sunday. No matter how old you are, you've had access to Passion Week for however many years of how old you are. Could this week be different? Could you truly get a deeper revelation of what Jesus did for us this week as we lead up to Resurrection Sunday? Think about the years past. Did it mean anything? Was it just the same old week? Did, somebody, did it have a little bit of conviction in it? If somebody said they were going to Good Friday service or they were going to go to Easter service or they were coming to Palm Sunday and kind of reminded you, oh yeah, there's something about this thing going on with Jesus during this week. Could this week be different? Could this message about Palm Sunday open up your heart this week? and see truly what he did for us. It's found in all four of the Gospels, so it must be pretty important, four different perspectives. I'll give you the scriptures, so those of you that want to study it this week, you can. The four God, and, and if you come to Rudy Right, you're going to get a lot of scripture. It's the only thing, I'm going to say it every week, it's the only thing that changes us. Yeah. Amen. Matthew 21, 1 through 9. Mark 11, 1 through 10. Luke 19, 28 through 40. John 12, 12 through 19. Those are the four areas that you'll find this Jesus coming to Jerusalem. We're going to start in John 12 through 15. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as a king. Verse 12. The next day, the crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. In just those scriptures alone, there's a fulfillment of two Old Testament prophecies as Jesus fulfills prophecy after prophecy in his life, his 33 years here on earth. I'm going to give you some Palm Sunday truths this week. And the first truth is this. Hosanna is not just a word for praise, although, it, yes, it means that. But it's a word for save now. The root word for Hosanna and for Jesus both mean save, rescue, savior. In Hebrew, it means help. Save, I pray. This is significant as the people were shouting Hosanna because it was the first time that Jesus is recognized as their king as the coming Messiah, as the one that they've been waiting for. This is the scripture they are quoting in the book of Psalms, and it's only quoted one time, and it has to do with Hosanna. It's found in Psalm 118.25 of the Old Testament, and this is the Hebrew phrase of Hosanna, but it's replaced with save, save please. It's a cry to God for help. Psalm 118.25, Lord save us, Lord grant us success, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it is certain that these words were used by the followers of Christ that day. 
and applied to him when he made his public entry into Jerusalem, crying Hosanna to the son of David. The word Hosanna is the same with save now or save us that we saw in Psalm 118. Matthew 21 says this in 9, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Don't just save us, God, but save us now. Is that where we're at today in the world that we live in? Is there a sense of urgency in our heart as we look at what's going on in this world all around us? And I meet with the men on Thursday and Friday morning at 6 a.m. And we can't help but bring up some of the current events. And we say, what is going on? How is this happening? Why is this being allowed to happen? And we can get blue, talk till we're blue in the face with all the list of things that are going on all around us. Are we looking for Jesus' return like the Jews were looking for the Messiah during this week of Passover? There's another psalm that exemplifies what our cries to God might look like today and maybe how we're feeling right now as we try and navigate this life that we live in. It's in Psalm 107, and we'll see the essence of this psalm is that Israel got in trouble, they cried out to God in their distress, and God delivered them. But watch what his desire is as he goes through uh, this script, as he goes through this psalm, this, this, this cry out to God. And at the end of each passage of the scripture, you will hear words repeated in all four of these in this psalm. Psalm 107, and this I do go to the King James, New King James Version. Normally we do the NIV. This is the New King James Version. You're going to hear these words repeated four different times. Psalm 107, 4 through 8. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. That's one that you're going to see repeated all four times. And he led them forth by the right way, that they may go to a city for a dwelling place. And this will also be repeated in all four of these passages. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. We go down to verse 11 through 15. Because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. And here is 18 through 21. Their soul aboard all manner of food. And they drew near the gates of death. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And finally, in Psalm 107, 26 through 31. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their souls melt because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. And they're at their wit's end. Has anybody ever been at their wit's end? Did you know that was in the Bible? We've all said that. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Now don't get this wrong. He's not rebuking them for crying out during a time of trouble. Not at all. He was wishing that men would give thanks all the time for his goodness. Wishing and believing it would be a lifestyle of thanks and praise instead of just times of trouble and sorrow. Are we in a state of mind today that's crying out to God saying, save us and wondering where he is in all of this. Not just save us, but save us now, Lord. Is there a sense of urgency? Here's another Palm Sunday truth that we see in John. Fear not. John 12, 14 and 15. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Fear not is one of the most frequently repeated commands in the Bible. It's a positive command. It helps us put our trust in God. And it's a good command. It's even used seven times 
in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And Genesis means beginning. We've also been talking about Alpha. Genesis means beginning, so from the very beginning, we are encouraged and told to fear not. Jesus didn't come to bring fear, he came to bring peace, and he is a God of peace. The palm branches that you hold in your hand or found on your chair symbolize goodness and victory. And the donkey that he rode on symbolizes humility and peace. Another Palm Sunday truth. Jesus came not as we expected. I wonder if that would be the testimony of so many of us sitting here. What Jesus done in our lives may have not lined up with what we had planned and how we would have done it. But this is another fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy as Jesus enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Zechariah 9.9, the coming of Zion's king. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Your king is coming, but just not as you would expect it. Matthew 21, 1 through 3 says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This is so different than any great military leader or king would have entered a city in those days. They would make a spectacle filled with pomp and circumstance, and they would come in riding on a higher horse. Have you ever heard somebody say, get off your high horse? That's what they're talking about. And I didn't realize my, my wife rode horses when she was younger, and they kept on talking about these hands and how they were measured. So she had 14 hands, right? 14 hands. She had a horse that was 14 hands. But that's 18 hands, sorry. <laughs> that's a higher one. Yeah, look at her on her high horse. <laughs> that's way up there. But Jesus was not on a king's horse. He wasn't even on a war horse. He wasn't on a horse that any other soldier would have rode in. Not even just a donkey but he was on a donkey's foal, a colt. Why a donkey, and even a foal, if you will? We all know donkeys can be stubborn, but we all know that donkeys can get some work done, too. They're strong. They struggle through. They're strugglers. They can persevere through struggle. The donkey is an icon of an unexpected barrier of God's presence. He messed people's minds. He messed with people's minds that day. They were expecting this great military victory, and he came in riding the donkey peacefully. Because Jesus is the Lord of your struggles. Think about it. He went on top of that donkey, and he says that if you give your life to me, I will sustain you through your struggles. He's sitting on top, victorious over your struggles if you trust him. This is total contrast to the second coming of Christ. Or we find in Revelation 19 and 11, the heavenly warrior defeats the beast. Look what it says. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. That's a little different picture than how he came to earth the first time and what his mission was for this week. The Jews were expecting a king to come for a temporary answer to their problems or problem and to be the savior of them for their current circumstance. Isn't it like us to only get focused on exactly what's going on in our lives only right now or around us only right now and missing out on an eternal perspective? But Jesus instead was here for a permanent solution. They were looking for a king to help them lead a revolt and overthrow the government. But Jesus was here to offer eternity. And so Jesus went in a few days from palms, which you hold in your hand now, to thorns. When Jesus was being whom they wanted them to wanted him to be, they were hailing him as king. As long as you do what as long as he was doing what they think he should do, he's their king. And they gave him palms and they honored him. But when Jesus was being who they needed him to be, they gave him thorns. When, we, when he was the savior of the world, when he brought eternity, when he came to die for our sins, then they put thorns on him. Even today, Jesus is your permanent solution. 
and our eternal solution, not just for our temporary problems that we face. Another Palm Sunday truth is this. Jesus is always in control. I know it just doesn't feel like it, right? We can just have this debate all day long. There's just no way that all this stuff would be happening around us. Just like this story that if you really dive deep, he knew more than the rest of them. They all had a plan of how they wanted to see this week play out and what kind of king Jesus should be, and he knew more. He had a bigger picture. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. In all of his gospels, Jesus actually foreshadows and tells his disciples exactly what's going to happen this Passion Week. Matthew 20, 17 through 19. Jesus predicts his death for a third time. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, it will be raised to life. Jesus was in control then, and he's still in control today. I don't know about you, but I don't like when I'm on an airplane and we run into a little bit of turbulence. We're missing our pilot. That's part of our leadership team. He's out of town this week. He'd be able to explain a little bit more about this, but I always, I kind of chuckle now. I, I always felt safer when I traveled with Chris and my kids because I said, well, I know the Lord might not take them because of how they're living. So I just want to ride on their coattails here at this plane ride. But when I was alone and when I was a slave to my sin, and you're going along and you're trying to watch a movie or have your mind go somewhere else and all of a sudden you feel that first bump. It's amazing how you start calling on the Lord. And I didn't like, I didn't like that turbulence. I don't like that turbulence at all. And why don't we like turbulence while we're on an airplane? Because you have absolutely no control whatsoever. And so as you sit there and feel those bumps, it's amazing how you connect and you pray and you ask for forgiveness for some of the things that you've done, and hopefully the Lord will allow you to land and try it, try it all over again. No matter what turbulence is hitting your life right now, either you personally or all around you, Jesus is still in control. I'm asking you this question, when that turbulence hits, is it time for you to take back control? When things get a little uncomfortable, or when you're feeling some pushback from the real enemy that we battle every single day? Or is it time to pursue a deeper level of trust in Jesus? I was encouraging someone this week from my own testimony, but there was some things that God was telling me to do before we started this ministry and started a church that I had been putting off for years. It was my safety net. It was my backup plan. And it even took me after I knew that it was stirring in my heart over and over and over and over again, that it was time to go into full-time ministry and give up everything else that you're involved in in terms of day-to-day -day operations and, and start to focus and concentrate on what God is doing in me and through me. And I finally, after six months, said, all right, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And some of you are sitting out there and it's been years and you're not sure because you have this nice safety net and you're living pretty comfortable and you're taking the good with the bad. But are we truly trusting and relying on God in every sense of the imagination, every sense of your life. You're saying, I'm trusting you, God, and I'm being obedient to what you're asking me to do. Stop playing everything out. Stop thinking about what's going to happen on the other side of you doing what God is asking you to do in prayer. When you get him involved, he's got something so much greater than you could ever imagine. It's time to pursue a deeper level of trust. With my word being boldness this year, God has asked me to take some Holy Spirit risks. And by the way, they keep coming. <laughs> Each and every week, they get a little tougher. Each and every week. He's asking me to get out of my comfort zone. And this year is just getting started. I mean, we're only in April. I can't wait to see. I'm excited. I can't wait to see what's on the other side of being obedient, to being bold for Christ. I pray that some would come along with me in that same challenge. Mark 11, 8 through 10 says, Many people spread their cloaks on the road while they spread branches they had cut from the fields. Those are the palm branches. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, salvation is coming. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king, is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Up until this point, Jesus had told the people that he healed or performed miracles on to kind of keep it on the down low. Don't, don't tell anybody. There was a reason for that. It wasn't his time to die yet. But he realized this day that the word was spreading. This is just on the heels of him raising Lazarus from the dead. And it's starting to spread his miracles. And so people are excited to see this Messiah, this coming king. And the word is spreading. And there's no turning back now. And I'm wondering, have we ever gotten to the place where there's no point of return? You've been trying this Jesus thing out for a while. You've been applying it a little bit in your life, but you've been that secret Christian. Is it time to say to yourself, "There's point of no. this is the point of no return. There's no backup plan anymore. I'm putting my full trust in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what these people were doing by saying Hosanna. This was a big deal that they were finally calling him the Messiah, the one they've been, they've been waiting for. This was the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecies. But look, even the Pharisees have something to say about it, as always, right? Luke 19, 39 and 40. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Jesus said even the rocks would cry out and sing his praises. If people don't recognize that I'm Jesus, that I am the Messiah, then even nature would sing his praises. The last Palm Sunday truth I want to put in your heart and mind today, and this is going to lead us into something that we're not used to doing here. Don't get all worried now. I watched some worship this week on the internet. And as we're reteaching Palm Sunday, as we're relearning our Christian faith in Alpha, the pillars of our Christian faith, how we live it out and how we share it. I'm just wondering if there's not so many people that are trapped in religion. Trapped in so much structure and in rituals. Just like those that might come and again, there's no condemnation. I will love to have this whole place full for Easter Sunday. But if you're just coming on Christmas and Easter, have you really made Jesus the Lord of your life? Do you know what it's like to truly connect? Part of Alpha and anybody that preaches the Word of God or has experienced a relationship with Jesus is this thing where it goes from head knowledge to heart knowledge. What I want you to see at the end of this last uh, truth from Palm Sunday is the way people that truly connect in the Spirit during worship. And we're going to find out that worship is not just singing songs. We'll talk about that in a minute. I get it. Maybe we don't even know what true worship looks like. But I don't want you to be uncomfortable at all with what you're about to see on the screen. You're going to see people completely engaged, praising God, crying, crying out to God, much like we've heard over and over and over again during this message, right? I think we've heard that several times, that his people cried out to him. You're going to see this, and you know what? If you're not ready for that, just watch others. And just wonder if this is something that I need, that I want in my life, and that it's time to pursue. Why? And I'm not saying that everybody has to worship the same way either. Please don't get me wrong there. It, you're not a better worshiper if you're going to be on your knees crying. And, and, and you might be there. I'm talking about the connection that you're about to see. But worship just isn't singing in a building. Worship is, isn't just songs. Worship, I read this week, some this might resonate with, but the next, I think, point is even more powerful. But worship is the joyful response in all that we are, in adoration and celebration in all that God is. How can we celebrate who God is in our lives if we don't know who he is? If we don't have relationship, if we haven't been retaught about what Jesus did for us, like we're learning right now. True worship is living a life that is pleasing to God, period. So you can measure up everything that you do throughout the week and say, 
was that pleasing to God? If you don't know, get around those that are versed in the Word of God or jump on that. <laughs> we'll go with good thing that Google can offer, one of the only good things that Google can offer to you, and that's that will take you exactly where the Word talks about whatever you're dealing with. Okay? True worship is living a life that is pleasing to God. We've read this during the summer, Romans 12, 1, 2, a living sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means it can happen. Then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. But many times we find it much easier to worship during times of blessing. We can come in church and things are going our way. Still might not raise our hand or say anything. I was joking around with Pastor Clarence this morning. And again, I pray that you don't take offense to this, but it's like we're all stuck. We, we, we don't want to show too much emotion. And my wife and I were, she was passionately telling me yesterday, she goes, I watch people watch sporting events and they're going nuts. I mean, crazy. And I'm not saying that that's what worship means either. It might be a quiet time for you, that, but are you truly connecting with Almighty God? But you think about the things that we get excited for. This is your personal Lord and Savior, the one that's saved you from your sins and granted you eternal life. And we sit there and we go, Almost like, should I praise you? Am I worthy of praise? Yes, you are. He created you to do that. Yes, you are. And I'm not trying to make, don't do anything that you're not uncomfortable with. Please. It, it, it should be to the place where you have so much freedom. You absolutely do not have any fear of man and could care less. Not that you don't care about the person next to you. You do. You could care less what they think about you raising your hands in the air and saying, thank you, Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna. I can't believe what you've done for me can't believe you saved me. can't believe you gave me another chance. I mean, you will not believe the freedom. When my wife used to praise the Lord in church while we were going through our difficult times, long difficult times, and we were separated and I was living in the dungeon, I got so angry, even in church, when I watched her raise her hand. And what are you raising your hand for? Our life's a mess. We're about to be done. I'm playing it all out, all these bad things. And she's there raising her hand, praising God. Through it all. That's why I'm standing here today. I'm standing here because of Jesus, but I'm standing because someone didn't give up. She didn't give in to her circumstances that you only see right in front of you. This week we talked about with the men. It's like we can live our whole lives right here, right here, whatever's happening around us. Go outside, just see the, go on TV, whatever's happening right in front of our eyes. Do we ever get... A bird's eye view, if you will. A God perspective. Get up out of there and look down about what's going on in this earth. This earth is groaning right now. This earth needs the second coming of Christ. I don't know when that's going to happen. I know people have been predicting it all the time. But there's some things that are happening that if you know your word, wow. Okay? Do we ever get above the noise and see what's going on? And if our life is like a vapor, isn't it way more important? that we have that type of perspective, then what's just going on in our horizontal view? Can we find time, like he was trying to talk about in 107, he said, can you praise him in the good times? Can you praise him in the rough times? No matter what's going on, can you walk in here with a clean and pure heart and a cultivated heart saying, Lord, I can't wait to receive your word. I can't wait to pursue more of you this week. And then live it out in my life, no matter what anybody else is saying around me. Again, the book of Psalms can be so comforting in this. As we experience these tough moments in our lives, Psalms often times show us an honest, authentic, and truthful way to cry out to God. Whether you're in times of sorrow or despair, the Psalms show us that we worship God even before the circumstances change. 
We show a new level of faith and trust. That's why it says in Hebrews 11 and 1, this is our faith in action. Now, faith is a confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. I, I probably haven't asked my wife enough about her testimony. <laughs> what were you doing raising your hand? What were you thinking? What was going through your body? I know some of it. What was going through your mind? What was going through your spirit? How were you doing that? How were you raising your hands in the midst of this and praising God? But many will miss what's right in front of them. We have this opportunity, just like I started the message, however old you are, you've had this week, Passion Week. You've had it every single week. You get to decide whether this week is different. You get to decide whether God gets to show you a deeper revelation of who he is in your life. Luke 19, 41 through 44 says this. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. This is supposed to be a great day. This is supposed to be like, yeah, you guys finally realize I'm the king. I'm the Messiah. No. He wept. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your, within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Here he was right in front of them and they still didn't even recognize it. We didn't have access of somebody coming, running in right now and saying, hey, Jesus just, Lazarus from the dead. He just raised Lazarus from the dead. What? What would that do to our faith level this morning? What? Let, let's go see this. Are you kidding me? Let's go see this guy. I got to give credit to, I don't remember the pastor's name, but I saw this this week, so this is not me, but... Like I said, my goal is to uh, plagiarize the Bible, okay? And so, and I also do not hesitate to share messages that resonate with my heart and give somebody else credit. I don't need to have all the credit. I don't need to act like all these stories are mine. But he, he said this, and I, I kinda, it kind of hit me. He said, the more he reads this story, he wonders if the donkey is him in the story. That Jesus says, has Jesus ever sent somebody along your path? Jesus sent somebody to go get your heart. I know this is in our book, how many times God brought people along my path and I pushed it away. Jesus sent somebody, and guess what? When he came, he had to untie you. You were trapped in your sin. You were all wrapped up. You were not moving. You were stuck. But Jesus sent someone to save you from being tied up. And so he untied you, and then they were going to lead you to Jesus. But as you're on your way, somebody yelled just as they were untying those colts, hey, what are you doing? Have you ever had somebody, what are you doing? Why, why are you doing that in your life? Really? You're a Jesus follower now? Really? You're a Christian? Really? You're going to that church? Really? You're making those changes in your life? What are you doing? And the only place that I disagree a little bit, he, he said that in, in the Word it talks about Jesus needed the donkey. Jesus doesn't need us to accomplish anything. He created us to accomplish. He wants us. Okay, so I changed the need to Jesus wanted us. And so you say, Jesus, Jesus wants me. Jesus wants my heart. Jesus wants to love on me. And so you bring all your stuff, all your junk. You, you throw off all the things that you were bound up by, but then you come and you meet, you meet Jesus. And not only do you meet him, you let him go ahead and like we talked about earlier, if that donkey represents your struggles and represents peace, you go ahead and let Jesus be the Lord of your life and the only one on the throne of your heart and he'll guide you every step of the way. Every step of the way. I, I resonated with that. I think I was pretty stubborn. I was like that donkey waiting for someone to save me. And you know what? God brought a powerful man of God that wasn't going to compromise. 
wasn't going to compromise. No matter how many excuses I wanted to give him, no matter how much I wanted to lawyer up and tell him why this can't happen in my life, he would say, that's amazing, brother. And then he'd tell me some truth from the word. And then you get to do whatever you want with the truth. Nobody's forcing anything upon you. Just like this worship that we're about to watch, if you want to engage in worship, you go ahead and engage. If you want to sit there and just watch what that looks like, say, wow, that would be something to feel that. I wonder what those people are feeling. But I want you to see how they're, I don't think they're thinking about, I really don't. You, you can tell me if I'm wrong after service. I really don't think they're thinking about the election. I really don't. I really don't think they're thinking about the news. I really don't think they're thinking about what just happened in this world. And I'm not saying all those aren't a reality and that all of them can be brought before the Lord in prayer. I'm not saying that at all. I'm talking about there's moments that God just wants to minister to you. You and God. Not the person sitting next to you. Not the denomination that you belong to. Not your friends. Not your family. You. And these are these moments when we come together in one mind and one accord and we link up our faith, there should be absolutely no judgment in this room. If you want to throw your hands in the air, if you want to shout, I don't even care if you run around this room. I really don't. I mean, obviously there's some respect of everybody else's time with the Lord too. I'm just telling you, don't put God in a box of how it affects I used to watch this guy, and then I'm done. Taylor, and you can get that thing ready, please, that we're gonna watch. I used to watch this guy when I went to church in Tampa. Oh man, he was in the choir. Everybody else was singing and they're swaying, and that was awesome. You know, and the choir was amazing. Oh my gosh, about 100 people. The voices were just angelic, and I was just loving it. There was one guy in the back. He's up there, jumping like this, like crazy. All the time, he's the only one just jumping going like this, jumping, jumping. And I thought to myself, how is, what is going on in this guy's life that he can be that full of joy? How, how do you get there? Like I was, I was in the front row going like this for a while. I finally got, uh, oh, wow, there's some freedom. Whoa, wow, whoa, wow, <laughs> this feels amazing. By the way, if you can't do this in front of anybody else, do it in the mirror sometime. You will look at yourself in the mirror if you're a true follower of Christ, raise your hands up and just, just see what happens to you. Just, I just want you to try that and then give me some feedback. You, you'll be amazed. There's something really powerful about you surrendering and showing that you're praising God. That's what you were created to do. But I saw this guy jumping and jumping. So then I end up becoming a pastor on staff there and over the men's ministry and the athletes ministry. And I get to know this guy in the men's ministry. Oh my Lord, I cannot believe what's going on in this guy's life. What a tough life. Oh my Lord. I mean, so sad. So sad what he was dealing with. And to see him every single week praising God, jumping up and down for joy. That's a man that was doing his best to have an eternal perspective and not letting the circumstances that he was dealing with temporary circumstances. Have you ever made a permanent decision in a temporary situation? Yeah, I think we all have. Can we start being led by the Spirit? And start making God perspective decisions, not good decisions, God decisions in our lives. That means he gets involved. That means he gets asked. That means the people that we love, we run it by them and we get their perspective as well because they're connected to us for a reason. I'm talking about your spouse and maybe your children. Outside of that, that's between you and the Lord, not who you're connected with spiritually. But God will reveal that as well. And then you move forward in the power of agreement. Thank you, Lord. Oh, wow. There must be something to this, but worship must be you coming in agreement with God's plan. Thank you. I know the power of agreement, but worship, your true worship, your true living sacrifice, 
must be you saying, God, you are the one in control of my life, not me. And every single day, the men are trying to learn what this means, and so am I. And we say, die to self. There's your decision. <laughs> There's your way of doing it. There's God's way of doing it. And when you choose God's way of doing it, that's dying to self. And it's day after day after day after day. Let's take these eight minutes, and if you need to close your eyes and connect with God, you do that. If you don't know what, what this is like at all, you've never seen somebody worship like this, just enjoy it. Just watch and see what happens. I don't know if the thing's going to glitch. I pray not. I pray God did God not. But uh, we don't have always the greatest Wi-Fi connection, but we're going to give it a shot. So it'll be eight minutes, and then we're going to uh, take communion together. So this will open up our hearts and our minds for that. You are awesome. And omega. We worship you.
Thank you for your sweet presence, Jesus. There was a time when we went to church in Tampa. You wouldn't even be dismissed. You just, whenever you felt like you needed to leave, you left. And the sweet presence of the Lord would just be there. Sometimes you'd come back at 6 o'clock at night and it'd still be there at the altar. I miss those days. And I wonder how far we've got from that type of worship. Father, we seal in the name of Jesus. The word that went forth today, I pray this week that we feel your presence like never before, that some breakthrough just happened even during that time of true worship. Help us connect with you, Lord. There's so many things that are screaming for our attention, Lord. You know what they are. You show us and help us to start to get those out of our lives and replace them with your truth and your word. The time spent with you, Father. We thank you for what took place today. We thank you for your sweet presence in our lives. I pray as we embark on Passion Week that we feel ourselves doing it with you, Lord. We, we can't even imagine what it was like to be you or what you had to endure. But you did it for us, and so there's a piece of us that's right there with you. You did all of it to save us, that we no longer have to live in the guilt and the shame. Lord, you washed us in white as snow. You cleansed us with your blood. And you paint a very clear picture of why you came to earth as we unpack each and every day of this week. Help us prepare our hearts and cultivate our hearts as we move closer to Good Friday. And then, Lord, truly get ready to celebrate on Resurrection Sunday an absolute celebration for what you've done. Thank you for paving the way for us to do that with you. Thank you for allowing us access to an almighty God. We pray that what's been started here this morning would be watered and cultivated and more seeds would be planted and that you would use us mightily for your kingdom as we continue, continue in true worship with the way that we live our lives pleasing, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. In Jesus' name, amen.